Chapter Five of Our Little Canadian Cousin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Our Little Canadian Cousin by Elizabeth Roberts MacDonald. Chapter Five. Jack was the first to wake in the delicious stillness of the morning. When his mother opened her eyes a little later, she found him sitting up beside her with a look of delight and wonder on his face. The river talks in its sleep, he said, leaning over her with shining eyes. What does it say, Jackie boy? Mrs. Merrithew asked. I don't know the words yet, he answered, but I will some day. Yes, I believe you will, dear, his mother said with a smile and a sigh for she firmly believed that her boy, with his vivid imagination and quick apprehension, had the life of a poet before him. Just then, a shout from the boy's tent proclaimed that the twins were awake. Then Mr. Merrithew's cheery voice was heard, and soon the camp was alive with greetings and laughter. Under Mr. Merrithew's direction, and with his active assistance, a cooking place was soon made, and a bright fire inviting to preparations for breakfast. The device for cooking consisted of two strong upright sticks with forked tops, and a heavy horizontal pole resting upon them. On this pole two pot-hooks were fastened, from which hung the pot and kettles, and the fire was kindled under it. Then a little circle of flat stones was made for the frying-pan. The pot and kettle were filled with fresh water, and Susan's outfit was complete. Pending the erection of a camp washstand, and the choice of a safe and suitable bathing place, faces and hands were washed in the river amid much laughter, and with careful balancing on stones in the shallows. The toilets were barely completed, when three toots on the horn announced that breakfast was ready. A long table and benches were among the furniture which Dr. Gray and Mr. Merrihew had planned to make. Until their construction, they were glad to group themselves, picnic fashion, around a tablecloth on the ground. The way that breakfast was disposed of showed that the true camp appetites had begun already to assert themselves. Porridge and molasses, beans, bacon and eggs, and great piles of brown bread and butter vanished like smoke. Jackie astonished the party and alarmed his mother by quietly disposing of a cup of strong coffee, passed to him by mistake, and handing it back to be refilled with the comment that it was much more satisfying than milk. After breakfast, they all set to work with enthusiasm to make camp more comfortable. Susan washed dishes and arranged the provision tent with housewifely zeal. Mrs. Merrithew and Mrs. Gray brought the blankets out and spread them on the grass to air, drove shingle nails far up on the tent poles to hold watches, pin cushions, and innumerable small but necessary articles, and superintended the stretching of a rope from one pole to another, about a foot from the ridge pole. This last arrangement proved most useful, all the garments not in use being hung over it, so that the chaperon's tent, at least, was kept in good order. The gentlemen busied themselves in building the promised table and seats. Mr. Andrews had told them to make use of anything they wanted on his island, so the twins had hunted about till they discovered a pile of boards near one of the barns. These served admirably for the necessary furniture, and after this was finished, several cosy seats were made, by degrees, in favourite nooks along the bank. The morning passed with almost incredible swiftness, and even the youngest and hungriest of the campers could scarcely believe their ears when the horn blew for dinner. In the afternoon, some, bearing cushions and shawls, chose shady spots for a reed and a doze. Some set off in the canoes for a lazy paddle, and others organized themselves into an exploring party to visit the deserted house. Marjorie and Dora, Miss Covert, and Will Graham formed the latter group. The stone house was a curious structure, with an air of solidity about it, even in its neglected and failing condition. It had been built many years before by an Englishman, who did not know the river's possibilities in the way of spring freshets. When he found that he had built his house too near the shore, 
and that April brought water, ice, and debris of many sorts knocking at his doors and battering in his windows, he promptly, if ruefully, abandoned it to time and the elements. It might, long ago, have been so arranged and protected as to make it a very pleasant summer residence, but instead it was now used only for a week or two in haying time, when the haymayers slept and ate in its basement, for this quaint little house had a basement, with a kitchen, dining-room, and storeroom. Our visitors, having gained entrance to the hall by a very ruinous flight of steps and a battered door, descended to the basement first, admired the fireplace in the kitchen, and looked rather askance at the deep pile of straw in the dining-room where the haymakers had slept. There was a rough table in one corner of the room, and on it some tin cups and plates and a piece of very dry bread. The haying on the island was about half done. There was a short intermission in the work now, but it was to begin again very soon. They found nothing else of especial interest in the basement, so went to the hall above. Here were two good-sized rooms, one on each side of the hall. Each had a fine, deep fireplace, and in one were two old-fashioned wooden armchairs and a long table. The windows, two in each room, were narrow and high, and had small panes and deep window seats. Oh, what fun it would be to play keeping house here, Dora, Marjorie cried. Wouldn't it? Dora answered. Let us, Marjorie. Let us pretend it is ours, and choose our rooms and furnish it. That will be fine, Marjorie answered fervently, and soon the little girls were deep in a most delightful air castle. Let us play too, said Will persuasively, and Catherine answered without hesitation. Yes, let us. I feel just like a child here, and could play with a doll if I had one. Well, let me see. We will begin by deciding about the room, said Will. Let us have this for the study, shall we? And put the books all along this wall opposite the windows. And so these two children of a larger growth, played house with almost as much zest as Marjorie and Dora, and greatly to the amusement and delight of the latter couple when they caught a word or two of their muttered conversation. Upstairs were four rather small rooms with sloping ceilings, and in the middle of the house just over the front door, a dear little room without the slope, and with a dormer window. This shall be our boudoir, Dora said, as they entered and then stopped and exclaimed in surprise, for against one wall stood a piano. Almost the ghost of a piano, or the skeleton rather, at the very best, a piano in the last stage of decrepitude, but still a piano. Its rosewood frame had been whittled, chopped, and generally ill-treated, and more than half its yellow keys were gone. But, oh, wonder of wonders, some of those remaining gave a thin, unearthly sound when struck. It seemed almost like something alive that had been deserted, and the little group gathered around it with sympathetic exclamations. While they were talking and wondering about it, lively voices proclaimed the approach of the twins. "'We won't say anything about our housekeeping play,' said Dora hastily, turning to Mr. Graham, and Marjorie loyally added, "'Except to Mother.' "'All right, if you like,' the student agreed, and Miss Covert quickly added her assent. The twins admired the stone house, the fireplaces, and the piano, but with rather an abstracted manner. Soon the cause of their absent-mindedness transpired. Mr. Merrithew had met some Indians that afternoon, when they were out paddling, and had bought a salmon from them. This had led to a conversation about salmon spearing, and the Indians had promised to come the following night and show them how it was done. They could take one person in each canoe, and Mr. Merrithew said that Carl and Hugh should be the ones. Of course, they were greatly excited over this prospect, and chattered about it all the way back to the tents. That evening, when dusk had settled down, a great bonfire was built, and they all sat around it on rugs and shawls, in genuine camp fashion. First, some of the favourite games were played, proverbs, coffee-pot, characters, and then rigmarole, most fascinating of all. Rigmarole, be it known, is Gale told from mouth to mouth, one beginning it and telling till his invention begins to flag, or he thinks his time is up, then stopping suddenly and handing it on to his neighbour. 
the result is generally a very funny and sometimes quite exciting medley tonight mr merrithew began the story and his contribution wherein figured a dragon an enchanted princess and a deaf and dumb knight was so absorbing that there was a general protest when he stopped but the romancer was quite relentless and his next neighbor had to continue as best he could even jackie contributed some startling incidents to the narrative and when at last mrs gray ended it with the time honored and just at present most unfortunately out of fashion assurance that they all even the dragon lived happily ever after there was a burst of laughter and applause then someone began to sing and one after another the dear old songs rose through the balmy night sometimes they were solos but every now and then a chorus in which all could join dora sang every french song she knew a la claire fontaine at the clear fountain malbrook and entre paris et saint denis between paris and saint denis proving the favorites mrs gray who declared that she had not sung for years ventured on the canadian boat song and her bright smile haunts me still at last when voices began to grow drowsy and the fire burned low they sang the maple leaf forever and our own canadian home then rose and joined in the camp hymn forever with the lord with its and nightly pitch our moving tents a day's march nearer home the next day seemed to fly to every one at least but carl and hugh their hearts stood so set on the salmon spearing that for them the time went slowly enough till night brought the four indians with their torches and spears dr gray and mr merrithew walked along the shore to see what they could of the proceedings but the rest and even will were content to sit around the fire as before carl sat in the middle of one canoe and hugh in the other both greatly excited and both trying to think themselves quite cool only the steersmen paddled the bowmen kneeling erect and watchful and their spears in readiness the salmon spear is a long shaft with two wooden prongs and a metal barb between them the spearing of salmon by the way is restricted by law to the indians and any white man who undertakes it is liable to a fine Sticking up in the bow of each canoe was a torch made of a roll of birch bark fastened in the end of a split stick The red gold flare of these torches threw a crimson reflection on the dark water and shone on the yellow sides of the birches and the intent dusky faces of the fishermen watching for their prey Slowly silently they paddled up the stream till at last the silvery sides of a magnificent fish gleamed in the red light then like a flash a spear struck down There was a brief struggle and the captive lay gasping in the foremost canoe It was all too much for Hugh He had enjoyed with all his boyish heart the beauty and the weirdness of the scene But the beautiful great fish with the spear wound in his back. Well, that was different He was not sorry that the Indians met with no more luck and he was very silent when the others questioned them on their return as to the joys of salmon spearing when he confided to carl his hatred of the sport the latter shook his head doubtfully but you will help eat that salmon tomorrow he said well perhaps hugh answered but all the same it's no fun to see things killed and i'm not going to if i can help it a fortnight of camp life passed like a dream and it is hard to tell who was more sorry when the day of departure came dora who had written a regular diary letter to her father and mother and begun one of the stories that were to be like mrs ewing's said that never in all her life had she had such a beautiful time katherine covert with lifelong friends to remember camp by and all sorts of happy possibilities in her once gray life bore the same testimony with more if more quiet fervor Mr. Merrithew said he was ten years younger and Jackie opined that in that case there must have been living on an enchanted island But added that he was very glad he had not been made ten years younger like daddy Brown and plump and strong of arm the campers brought back with them hearty appetites delightful recollections and inexhaustible material for dream and plan and castles in the air Many pleasant things were waiting to be done on their return 
First and foremost, Miss Covert had come to live at the big brick house to teach the children when holiday time should be over, and to be a help generally to Mrs. Merrithew. Also, according to Mrs. Merrithew's plans, to have a little real home life and happiness, for Catherine had been an orphan since her childhood, and for five years had taught school steadily, although it was work that she did not greatly like, and that kept her in a state of perpetual nervous strain. Teaching a few well-bred and considerate children, whom she already loved, would be quite different, and almost entirely a pleasure. End of chapter 5